This is Babbitt Babbage, and we're going to be talking about uh, Walter Benjamin. Part of this is a live Zoom lecture that was given in the course Philosophical Aesthetics that's uh, being offered this term at Fordham University. It's a graduate course on Philosophical Aesthetics. And the, this week, the topic is Walter Benjamin, the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility. And uh, for that, we're going to reprise just a bit of what would have been a supplement that I don't think we had complete time to give as an addition to the pre-recorded now because previously live uh, version of this now recorded or mechanically reproduced uh, discussion uh, in a retrospect, putting the two parts, the part recorded on uh, live uh, in, in the lecture given on a Monday, and uh, the uh, current supplement, which will be available in what is called the asynchronous version of the class. And it's important to have both the synchronous or live uh, versions and the asynchronous, which one can consult and refer to probably most eminently of all in the case of the current topic. So let's go look at that uh, shared screen discussion of the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility. The person that we're talking about here is like Andy Warhol, not insignificantly, because Andy Warhol exemplifies the entire phenomenon of the technological reproducibility of the work of art. And that's what we have with Benjamin. So one thing to think about, born in 1892, um, he dies in 1940 and he dies uh, at his own hand. So, so there is a, a tragedy involved. And one thing that we might want to think about, of course, is just a little bit about the history of that, the arcades project. There's a lot of things that we could have looked at to talk about in the context of philosophical aesthetics. Uh, we chose the work of art in the age of technology. It's, it's tech, technische Reproduzierbarkeit in German is technological reproducibility because here the question is the ability to be made by means of technique. So all of the things that we've been talking about, the Greeks didn't have a word for it, uh, Shiner's reflections, uh, this just means technites, as we saw with reference to Tamanio's comments on Heidegger. So, and the, the idea of the origin of the, of the, of, of, of the war artwork, here now, there's no, not necessarily a technites, not necessarily an artist. Now what's going to make all the difference will be the medium, will be the means of reproducibility. Now, original translation of this text, and you may have a version of it like that, does say the work of art in the era or age of its mechanical reproduction. And mechanical reproduction is, is a common way of talking about technical reproducibility. But Technological is more accurate. It's what we would use if we were talking Heidegger, and it's indeed what he has in mind. It's also related to the politics, the political dimension, the politics of art. And uh, this uh, is uh, one of the last photographs uh, that we have, very official photograph. He's trying to get out of, uh, out of France and therefore to emigrate uh, as he, he seeks to do so to the United States. But there are several visas that are required. One of the frightening things as we live in the current world is we may find ourselves understanding too, little too much about visas and permission and uh, other things to go freely from point A to point B uh, can be more complicated. But at the time it was standard and got worse because what that meant was you could have that permission withdrawn. And uh, that famously happened in his case because of course, uh, the uh, Spanish government decided at that last moment to require uh, uh, visas of a kind that he didn't have. And that was why he was attempting to pass through Spain was because that wasn't required. Here's one of those images that are and tend to be reproduced, repeated uh, mechanically, Benjamin. Younger Benjamin, obviously. There's a biography 
uh, Berlin, there's the early Benjamin, there's the late Benjamin. So just as with Heidegger, you have the early and you have the middle and you and you have the late. And and we're looking pretty much at a text that counts as a middle period uh, text, or rather middle late, middle late, middle late. Um, this is Port Bou, uh, where Benjamin dies, 1940. So that means that means relatively early in the war, which makes it more tragic to a certain extent because, in fact, he is responding in advance. So things have not gotten as bad as they would get. He himself spent time in an internment camp. So it's not that that wasn't as it happened, but then he was released. And of course, he thought, you know, get out while the getting is good. And he attempted to do that. So if we go back then to this portion when he died in, in 1940, um, very fatally, very, very fatalistically, uh, his friends who were leaving because the border was opened up the very next day, he, he, he took uh, his life that evening and uh, the next day everyone was free to travel, make go, go on their way as they intended to do and they did. But the last thing they did was they bought a grave for him, but they only bought it for five years. So 1945, there was a great deal of chaos and confusion and his body was uh, buried, uh, exhumed from where it had been buried because the five year for which he was, he had paid for, you have to pay for a plot, uh, was up. <clears throat> and so his, he was, his remains, his remains were placed in a mass grave. Uh, so no one has any idea where his grave are. So if you see, I, I think I have an image of, of Benjamin's grave, but it's, it's, he's not there. Uh, and a, a memorial plaque was put up overlooking the, the Mediterranean very, very wonderfully in Port Mou. Uh, this is <clears throat> one of a postcard that he writes uh, here, as you see, it's posted from, uh, from San Remo to Hannah Stan. Hannah Stan is Gunther Stan's uh, wife. Uh, that is Hannah Arendt. So they were good friends. And that's fairly significant because that's why we largely have some of these works. So the Passagen Arbeit that I referred to, the, the Passagen Weg that we could have worked on, the archives, uh, 1927 to 1939, this is unfinished. So we have what we think is probably it. A lot of people have worked on it, but it's very much what Heidegger was warning against, the incursion of editors, because everything we have is the result of editors. Benjamin himself never finished it. We see him working at the archives here. He collected <clears throat> all kinds of quotes and citations. He didn't have a computer, so he had to write them all down and he had them on hand. And that was one of the things that he needed for all of his work were all of these little perfect quotes, perfect citations, the best quote. That's what he was. He was a collector of quotes, in fact, and he was that kind of author. So he wasn't really a professor. He didn't work as a professor. Um, he had trouble finding employment of various kinds. But what he liked to do was to work in libraries and collect quotes. <clears throat> a couple of things but we don't have time to go because we started a little. We took a, a few moments longer to start with. But I want to go just this is obviously a, a, a iconic and people have made images of it. Here's one of them. Here we have an ink bottle and the image that we had, there are several different versions. There were three actually, uh, versions of the, of, of the work of art in the age of its mechanical reproduction or it's, as you see in this most, that's actually a giant collection of Benjaminian writings, glorious uh, collection of technological uh, reproducibility. But earlier, this would have been known and it was brought to the public by means of Hannah Arendt's efforts to take Benjamin's Illuminationen, which had appeared in the Sear competition in 55, 1955, 10 years uh, after the end of the war. And she brought that over effectively into English. Harry Zone did the translation, she didn't do the translation, but she wrote the introduction. So we're gonna talk just a tiny bit about that. You see, it's the same image in effect. 1955 with plenty of plenty of plenty of technological ability for technological reproduction and so you have that <clears throat> in Surkamp. Surkamp has now gone to no pictures at all if you're a fan of Surkamp editions and in 68 this appears simultaneously Arendt in three different installments publishes in Mercure which is very very uh, impressive uh, uh, philosophical journal uh, I don't know if you know it, it, what, what technical name you want to have for it in in uh, and for 
literary works, philosophical works, theoretical works, a range of works, and she publishes the first three sections, one after another, in uh, January and March, and then again in April. And those are the passages you can see if you have the full text of the Illumination. So we're going to talk about just a little bit. You see it here, that same way, January, February, which is that first section, and then that's about the Hunchback. And then, of course, Dark Times. Dark Times becomes very important if you're a Hannah Arendt scholar and you're very keen on Hannah Arendt. That was in March of 68. And then this beautiful image, the Pearl Diver. So, and that becomes also terribly influential in April of 1968, when, every, when the world was falling apart by means of student revolutions and so on and so forth. So her text is really, Wer war Walter Benjamin? But that's not the title we see. Who was he? Who was this guy? Okay, so that's the page of that. And one, the suicide Bertolt Brecht has a phrase saying, basically, you guessed it all. You figured it all out. You were, uh, you, you're better than the rest of us. And uh, that's a wonderful kind of, of, of claim. But how else shall we understand that besides Walter Benjamin as a great predictor of the future, which he can seem to be. There's also the one-way street uh, that has been made in this YouTube video. I'm going to put that. It's not there yet, but in case you're interested um, and, and in case you like, you can go and look at it and maybe later in the term, you might want to go back and look at it. I will add that after class uh, to the Blackboard website so you can you can see uh, something about that. But you can also find it for yourself by simply looking John Hughes uh, one way street. This is the grave stone that isn't a gravestone because his 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 he's he's not there in any in any in any sense whatsoever uh, to commemorate uh, his death, uh, but also uh, because of his fame. He's enormously famous. We saw the, in the, in the text. Illuminations, if you have the book, it begins with Kafka, goes to theater, Baudelaire, very important, Proust. And then what we're looking at is this uh, work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. As you see, that is the shock in translation. It's it is technische reproduzierbarkeit, so the, it's not quite accurate. So it's more correct to say technological reproducibility followed by the theses on the philosophy of history. And there is Hannah Arendt, enormously happy about the German version. As you can see, she's holding the German 1955 a copy of the Schurkamp edition of Benjamin's, the same texts, the same texts in uh, German. And uh, she also is available on YouTube herself with, her, she gave some interviews about him. What I want to do is pause for just one moment. This is too dense to read, so I won't read this all together for you, but I will try to talk through it and talk about it. One of the things she, she tries to do using, but she doesn't italicize it, the, the Latin fama for fame, uh, to talk about posthumous achievements, posthumous uh, importance. And her claim is that it's just not the one you want, which is, which is you could raise, you could wonder about that because Immanuel Kant himself says, I'm going to be famous in 100 years. And Nietzsche talks about himself as past born to be famous later after his time and so on. And of course, Heidegger is very dedicated to it. But her point here is that posthumous fame doesn't do you any good because the one who could benefit is dead. And so there's no benefit for posthumous fame to the person who is thus made famous. And that means it's uncommercial and unprofitable. But of course, although it's uncommercial and unprofitable for Benjamin, it's very commercial and very profitable for others. And so that's not her theme, but that's something we might want to think about. And of course, that since then has really become a whole question. So it's not just that Benjamin kind of misses a certain insight. Hannah Arendt's point of departure and introduction is, uh, uh, does raise a few sets of questions. She quotes Cicero. Si vivi vicisent qui morte vi cerhont. How different everything would have been. And it's a very sardonic statement if you think about Cicero himself. It's a, there's an irony there. If they'd been victorious in life, who have won victory in death, if we had only listened to those individuals and so on and so forth, but also if things had worked out better for them. 
Now, the second point that she tries to make in her introduction, and it's worth paying attention to if you're interested in the question of the thesis and the philosophy of history, is her reflection on the dialectic. Now, we're not going to have tons and tons of time because he's too hard to talk about Adorno. But we're going to talk about Adorno because you cannot do philosophical aesthetics today without Adorno. Adorno is like the cab of us at the gate. You have got to go through Adorno and almost no one can. And you can't simply say, I don't like Adorno or Adorno didn't like jazz. And so what could he, you know, because Adorno is, if you, if you like the one who forms and to a certain extent will form, especially for artists, for people who work in art. So it's something very important because Adorno himself was an artist. He was a composer. He com Composed the new music. He didn't compose old but cutting edge new music and wrote on film, music for the films, and so on. But <clears throat> that's exactly the problem because, as Aaron points out, Benjamin's best friends, Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno, do not like what he writes insofar as they think he misses the point when it comes to Marx. And if you've ever had a Hegelian friend, or maybe you are the Hegelian friend, you know, you could. The problem is that you've got to get Hegel exactly right, or your Hegelian friends will not talk to you. You know, they will not give you the time of day that you, you, you don't understand. Or if you have an Augustinian friend, same thing, right? But there's got to be a, 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 a terrifying exigence. And they thought that when it came to dialectic, that would be the problem. And that's what Arendt summarized. She says, look, come on, nothing could be more undialectic. If they're saying he's undialectic, he certainly is. Why? Because the angel of history incorporates nothing Hegelian, enough, nothing Christian. Hegel's very Christian. Nothing ultimately about this fulfillment in time, but rather has his face turned toward the past. And then there's that wonderful quote which is, of course, she quotes him, uh, 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 Benjamin, where a chain of events appears to us, what he sees, he, because his back's turned, so he has an entirely different perspective, sees one single catastrophe, which keeps piling wreckage upon wreckage and hurls it in front of his feet. The angel would like to stay awake in the dead and join together what has been smashed to pieces, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, the wind keeps blowing, that's the rest of the passage, and of course, so he cannot do that. But Arendt adds a parenthesis that if he stayed would mean the end of history. So of course, if he were able to do anything, it would also be sort of the last thing he'd do in history or for the time. So the angel in Clay's Angulus Nervous, this is the flaneur. Now the flaneur is a little complicated. We're gonna kind of pause and try to get to that for an, in a moment, just to consider it because this Angelus, Novas. Uh, th this clay painting was in Benjamin's possession. He had this. He had he had purchased it from Gershom Scholem, and when he died, uh, it went back uh, to Scholem again, and uh, it is kept uh, in their collection until finally it's in it's in it's in Israel, and you can see it there. That's the reference to the flaneur. One thing, and it's worth reading Hannah Arendt for this, and also maybe you have a friend like this, somebody who's out of step with the time, someone who's archaic, uh, they seem to come from a bygone era, they speak with the stilted accent, they, 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 from, the, from the last century, right? There are all kinds of, of, of ways that one can speak today, uh, but they speak with the bookish accent of another time period. And I don't think even we can know what that sounded like any longer, but at the time people would, and that's how Baudelaire describes it. And that's how Benjamin identified. He identified with Baudelaire and of course also with the arcades uh, in Paris. That's where he really felt at home. And that's where he felt he belonged. And the task of the translator, which is, I just remembered the very first text I ever taught uh, when, I, when I began teaching uh, grad classes, uh, was the task of the translator. So no poem, Benjamin writes, is intended for the reader. Very interesting way of talking about it. So there's a question of the authorial fallacy that's built in here, no picture for the beholder, no symphony <clears throat> for the listener. That almost repeats what we saw with Nietzsche because Nietzsche makes that distinction between the artist and the spectator. So the 
the poet, the artist, the composer, they are not composing for anyone to hear. That's really, really important uh, for artists, for, for genuine art. It's very, very different, of course, if you're a journalist. If you're a journalist, you're definitely writing for an audience, obviously, or, or you'll lose your job. He begins with a quote, <clears throat> and it's actually fairly difficult to understand the quote of fine arts, where they come from. This quote is the conquest of, of ubiquity from the poet Paul Valéry. And what's significant about this is really his, the heart of the quote, the amazing growth of our techniques, the adaptability and precision they've attained, the ideas and habits make it a certainty that changes are impending in the craft of the beautiful. He continues, that quote goes on, Benjamin dies five years before Valéry, who, who's older than he is, 1871 to 1945. For the last 20 years, matter time, space time haven't been what they were. So this is a relatively late text, post-Einstein, so on and so forth. And, and of course, post-Heisenberg, we have to expect innovations in technique to transform the art. So it's, so it's the artist saying, get with it, make with the program. And that's his quote. That's how he begins. He begins with Valerie, a poet, talking about a poet. And then he begins with his dialectic, saying all the stuff that Max Horkheimer and Theodore Adorno would dislike, the critique of capitalistic mode, that's the problem, can't really work. And what's it for? It's only going to be to exploit the proletariat, creating conditions which would make it possible to abolish capitalism itself. You could expect that. That's not what happened. 1927, Metropolis. Fritz Lang, one of the most important films, but also a film which embodies art, art in, in, in a kind of mechanical way to the point of mechanically reproducing the human being, Maria the robot, uh, because she's much better. It's like one of the sex dolls today, you know, it's one or kind of a lady who would do what you want her, not rabble rouse the public in, in bad ways, but rabble rouse the public just the way the owners would like it. So they had her created for that purpose. So this will then be the question at the very, very least for understanding what the developmental tendencies of art would be under the present conditions. This is 1936. So we are now looking at a time period, almost a decade, nine years after Met this film, Met Metropolis, but also the time of the Nazi success and the transformation, therefore, of what Germany is going to become. So Germany is under this crippling social condition for itself because of its loss in World War I, and of course, also this political uh, change that's underway. This is an image from Metropolis. So what you are seeing is death come to give a talk. And it's scary because we're in the middle right now where death almost seems to be politically talking to us in very different ways uh, and definitely wearing a mask. So today there would be a mask on this guy. So the fascism is going to be, and this, this, is, this, this, this will be the suggestion that on the one hand, you could have an art of fascism. And on the other hand, you could have a liberating art, another art that might be able to do other possibilities, creativity, genius, none of that eternal value, none of that mystery concepts and so on. <clears throat> this is the Maria Robot uh, being invented. This is the inventor inventing her. And this is just standard invention stuff in Germany of 1927. But she, of course, when she's transformed, just looks like a complete human being because she's not done yet. But when she's completely finished, she's uh, indistinguishable from a human being, which is, of course, a transhuman idea. That's where he begins then. Reproducibility, the German, not the term here, reproducibarkeit. Hans Gumbecht likes to emphasize, you may have taken note of that in one of the uh, readings that we'll get to if we have time, that Benjamin really likes to just chuck on the word Bakhide, uh, ability after everything, almost like Deleuze faculty, ability or capacity to do something. But here the idea, this is a clay cast, you'd be able to make again and again and again the same. And likewise, the bronze, the Greeks could make those bronzes very important thing in mass numbers. That's the most amazing thing about them. They didn't have one or two of them. They had thousands of them. 
indeed they had tens of thousands of them and of course we know it doesn't even we don't even think twice about it Nietzsche talked about it in the coin right that's what we were talking about last week with stamped and stamped and stamped you know basically if you have a coin you have the same thing that you can manufacture and manufacture the same value the same image that's the case they're always in principle and of course they're made you learn to make a copy when you take a bio, a bio lab, you kind of, you're going to draw the cell that you're looking at under, under, under a microscope. Masters are going to make various copies of the work to sell versions of them, think of Van Gogh. And then third parties in pursuit of gain will also make them just to be able to sell them, right? If, if you've been to Athens, you'll see lots of, or, or, or Delphi or Olympia, uh, you'd be able to see little, little, little shops set up where copies of things might be on sale. Same thing in Paris, in Montmartre. So that's the mechanical reproduction. The Greeks have only two ways. Founding, which is what you do for a bronze cast, and stamping out, which will be the reference to the coin. Those were artworks produced in quantity. Anything else would be unique and could be mechanically reproduced. So if you had a Greek marble statue, that would be a and unicum, one off. The Romans, on the other hand, very important about the Latins, the Romans could make copies completely identical of marble statues. They can still do that. That's a, that's a great achievement in Italy. So that would be slightly different. Print is what he's talking about. You get engravings and etchings, you get the woodcut, you get lithography, and that means you can print it. So at the beginning of the 19th century, you're going to be able to have what Malraux is going to call a museum without walls. That's a wonderful thing. That is the art book. And in that art book, you can think of Winkelmann. Uh, you can have prints reproduced so you can see copies of everything that fascinates or interests you in that way. Those give you art copies and they can be stamped out and reproduced. This, of course, a 15th century manuscript would be a one-off. You'd only have one of those unless you made a forgery, which people, of course, think they're worth a lot of money. They do. Now, Benjamin was a collector, which means he was very, very interested in getting something that would have the value for a collector. And therefore, he knew a lot about things of that sort. So 1430 AD, this is a manuscript that you can see. This is obviously an alchemical, but also spiritual manuscript. <clears throat> and similarly, from print to sound. Now, Benjamin doesn't spend a lot of time on this. This was very interesting to Adorno. And it should be very interesting to all of us today. Uh, and it's important for music if you watch YouTube or anything. The technical reproduction of sound was tackled at the end of the last century. That means at the end of the 19th century, which means that everything that we need to have for recording has already been accomplished in terms of that sense. And you have images of this. It's first used in that way. A film operator is able to pick these things up. And the first thing you do is you get an Indian chief and you sit him down and you, Museum of Natural History did this and you record what he's saying and you take notes on it and you have the cylinder and it can be played back again so you can hear his voice. And it's the same point that's made. And, and Valerie says this, like the internet, we're doing it now, we're doing this. We shall be supplied with visual or auditory images which will appear and disappear in a simple movement of the hand. So that ability just at a flick of a hand also becomes very, very significant for Paul Otle, who is a Belgian uh, uh, inventor of what can be called the memex, something that allows us to have all the images and all of the things that we understand at every sense of the word available for us. And that then becomes Veneva Bush's theory of how to how, how to create the internet because it's way before Al Gore and so on. But that's already here in that earlier passage that Benjamin is citing in 1936. So there's a very old notion, the internet. It is not new. It's old, old, old. But there we are doing exactly that at a click just to have that. And I think that this is more fun games and also obviously same thing, but it doesn't have to be a click, it could be swipe. And kids are better at it, right? These kids are not bothering their parents, very important. Uh, and where we are now, right? So, so, so we are, whether we like it or not, written into this text. What do we think about that? How do we understand it? But nonetheless, here we are 
bringing ourselves and our class to each other in the same way that Valerie is suggesting. Now, the first thing is that is suggested is that the medium transforms what's going to count as the work. That is to say, <clears throat> the reproduction, the reproducibility changes the work. That's a very important thing. So even painting is going to change because of work and film changes because of colorization, which then changes films that are meant to be color. We can see the history of that, but even those things is obviously subsequently colorized. That's a very glorious warrior. And similarly for the wood, for any kind of a woodcut. This is of course an Ivan Illich type of protest against educating people in other traditions and other cultures. Uh, this would be American uh, 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 autochthonous residents of the United States before uh, uh, the United States became the United States in Canada and in the US who were forced to often with religious orientations go to school. Why, did you, why does anybody need to go to school? If you don't come from a culture with school, why on earth would you have to go to school? It's a really good question. Rather than, and learn about birds and rocks and trees by reading about them right, rather than in another mode. And that's a very important point because of course it's imperialism and underdevelopment and it is what we do. And sometimes people protest about that. Okay, that's partly there, but what he's interested in is looking at film and that's exactly what he goes through. Now we're in section two to the aura. <clears throat> now the most important thing in Benjamin is the aura and it is the most misunderstood and it is the most difficult thing to understand even though he defines it. So it's not as if Benjamin doesn't tell you what it is, he does, but people still fail to understand it. And what is interesting is that we spoke about Nietzsche and we spoke about Heidegger last week and Heidegger focuses on this presence. Everyone's interested in the fight, the clash between you know, you know, earth and world, but it's really a question of presence in what? Time and space. So there's that Kantian element, which is also important here, meaning its unique existence at the place where it happens to be. That uniqueness is what's often missing, right? And, and, and you know, when people I wonder about physical contact or contacting one another, one, what, the occasion of just running into somebody is, is, is also challenged a little bit. So the most perfect reproduction the most perfect arrangement of an app to connect people is lacking in just one element, right? And we have that, that presence in time and the focus there is the copula and space, both together at the same time and in the same space, which is what makes the existence unique. In order to even know anything about that, you're gonna need the original. This is the Croatian Apoxiomenos, which they just they just dredged out of the Adriatic a couple of years ago, just just uh, uh, not even three decades ago. And for that, you're going to you're going to be able to judge it by looking at the bronze itself and determine its age and so on. And the same thing is also true of various medieval manuscripts. But you need an original. And the original is going to enable you to compare. This is precisely what someone working in an antiquariat will do. This is precisely what someone who is a collector of valuable ancient books or a museum curator dealing with historical artifacts. In order to deal with the historical artifact, you've got to have one to compare. And then you're back to what Nietzsche was talking about in the origin, uh, uh, as he said, of, the, of how we know what a Homeric text is or is not. Key point here is that this is that the entire sphere of authenticity has nothing to do with technology. Almost like Heidegger would say, it's nothing technological. Why? Because if you make a manual, if you use a paintbrush, reproduction of a Van Gogh, you're forging it. If you photograph it, you're a tourist. 
and you're just getting something that's interesting and it's creative and you can do remix and you can re you can rework it and you can use it in creative commons and i can throw it in a powerpoint and all of that because it's technological reproduction technological reproduction is completely different from the best copy you could make with your hands because even though you could make a perfect copy perhaps you would be making usually typically a forgery or something quite strange because you did it all by yourself etc but the original would keep the authority not so vis-a-vis -vis technology and everybody knows this if you're if you're if you're if you're getting a, a phd or a master's degree from fordham university you will be required to submit a thesis and part of the statutes of the university says that you have to deposit an original just as rousseau had to deposit an original, and he did, you know, in Paris. And then Descartes did the same thing, you deposit the original. But what does that mean when you don't have an original? An original and a copy, right? But, but what's an original and a copy? Right? So, 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 so even I, old as I am, wrote my dissertation on using a computer, printed it out, and then I was confronted with the problem. I have the printout. I give a copy of the printout. They're completely identical. In fact, there's no difference between them. You couldn't separate them. You can write one on the other and two on the other because there's no difference. In fact, the second one, the copy would, 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 would possibly be better if the printer had its wheel changed at the time they had, they had print wheels. Very interesting thing uh, because it was a very complicated machine. Very nice. Not like the, cheap, the cheaper ones was the university's print was a very, very high end machine. So, the point is, what you're getting is precisely this disposition that Heidegger complains about with regard to the Sistine Madonna. You were able to take the object, whether it's going to be Beethoven's quartets or whether it's going to be Van Gogh's paintings, and you can send those all around the world. They can go on tour, and that's, of course, what they do. When they do that, that means that the original is out of its place, its locale. So what? Remember one more time. It's commissioned by Pope Julius for the newly built Benedictine monastery, right? Remember that. And then you have this question of the green tapestries, the curtains. Why does it have green curtains? We mentioned that last week. Why? In a footnote, that's Benjamin's footnote, he refers to Hubert Grimmer, who points out that it was painted for an exhibition, but it was painted in fact for something fairly significant, namely the funeral, the public lying in state of Pope Sixtus. And that of course allows one to have the papal coffin in clouds and you could approach that. So it's actually designed as a backdrop. It's meant to give you the effect of transfiguration, transportation, almost like some of the other uh, Raphael paintings that we might know. And that's also related to the aura. What quality that do you get? It's the authenticity, that's the essence that's transmissible, and that's what is lost. The aura is lost. The authenticity is lost. What Benjamin says, probably the most quoted statement ever uh, in, in his writing, that which withers in the age of technological reproduction is the aura in the work of art. So what is that aura? How does one understand that? First of all, it's detached. You get plurality, you get a bunch of them. What's the original? What's not the original? How can you really tell uh, if you submit uh, for, uh, in, you know, if you're doing track and trace, you're doing various other things and you must submit a copy of a photograph of yourself or if you're applying for a visa and you have to send in a, a photograph of yourself as well. Again, you have a, a confronted with the same question. Artists don't look at it that way. Abagans, he makes Napoleon, et cetera, thinks that this is the future. All of these new technologies seem to be the way to go. Everyone's going to be making films, thought Abagans. To a certain extent, that would be true. But what is the aura? You can see that these are ginkgo leaves, and obviously it's the time for ginkgos to be, to be 
were producing themselves. But Menumin defines, this is on page 222 to 223, we define the aura as the unique phenomenon of a distance. So you're going to be able, it's like a partner, you're going to be able to see the authenticity, the age of the thing that you're looking at. So you would be able to see if you follow in the distance, even if you just go down to, that's that's a Bethesda garden uh, in, 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 in a fountain, excuse me, in a central park and people, if they're not getting married underneath uh, the, the arches there, if you go there, you will be able to see the same. And if you look over into the distance of the trees as they change, you would, and you look at the shadow or the shadow is cast, you are getting almost a touch of that distance and that space, what you get is the aura of the object in the distance, the mountains, the branch. That's the aura of nature. And of course, what he means to say is that you can look at this as a loss of aura. And that means, of course, that the work of art in this particular point now becomes a work of art that's without aura and meant to be without aura. It's a very, very interesting thing, which is kind of, kind of nice. So it's, so, so the ritual is lost and maybe there's more liberty possible. That's the political element of it that he argues. He, this is when only up to section five, but he wants to say that that's different from what Nietzsche had spoken about with regard to the cult and the accessibility of the work of art as something that is on display. Certain aspects, very important for Greek temples. It is essential to a Greek temple, the ancient Greek temple, that no one but the priest goes inside. That's really important. Certain statues of gods are accessible only to the priests in the cellar. No one goes inside. So if you're going to make an offering, you're going to leave that offering outside at the door. You do not go inside. It's not made for you to go inside. In fact, most of it, the of an ancient Greek temple is outside. So the outside is the most important part. So people say, oh, I would like to go inside. You wouldn't want to do that. And the same way, there are things that are covered up in a church. What is changed is film. Film is the desire to be intimate, closer than close with people you have never met. That's Greater Garbo. And people, even if they don't haven't watched one of her films, might know her name because they are on intimate terms with her because she's famous. Other photographs have similar qualities of that immediate intimacy, something worth thinking about. We have uh, some of the of, of the photographs. This is the uh, Anhalter Bahnhof in Berlin. Nothing is left but that doorway of that train station in Berlin. Only the doorway stands. A vanished world, woman Vishniak and verschwundene Welt and so on. So you would see uh, some of these in the same way. Uh, what, what is this happening? The quote that he gives us, and he's, he's, he's interacting with Rudolf Anheim. Rudolf Anheim is, is, is a psychologist to understand what happens to the actor when the actor moves from the stage to the film set, the, 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 the set for filming, whether it's going, it doesn't matter if it's going to be Fritz Lang or anyone else, what happens to performance? And what happens to performance is that acting disappears. The more you act, the less effective you are on screen. So it's a very important thing. If you put your energy into speaking, you lose. So the greatest effects are almost always obtained by acting as little as possible. Why? The camera doesn't move or pick up on things as fast as the eye does in face-to-face. -face. One of our problems with the, and the reason why I'm really looking forward to the, we're gonna stop in just a moment, second half of class is that we don't have in a Zoom video, the up or a Zoom encounter, the kind of availability to one another, presence to one another that we have face to face. Face to face, we have so much richness that we don't even notice, but we don't have that. And we can't have that in this mode. And that's what many means writing about, or, or even though this many, many years ago. So it's very, very relevant. So what, a, what does Hollywood do? 
Hollywood makes these guys get married. Right? But they didn't actually like each other, there's a detail, but they got married and they got divorced and so on. But, but they had to get married because otherwise Twilight wouldn't have apparently survived. So what you get is a buildup of the personality outside the studio. And we have that <clears throat> same thing. We know all about Rickman and so on and so forth or any, anything else you like or Game of Thrones, same kind of thing. The movie star, and, and we can see with Harry Potter, it's a really good example because as he ages, it doesn't really work as well for him as because he loses the, the one who is putting that out, which is the spell of personality. It's not about the person. It's about this, uh, which, of course, he has not been for years. Benjamin adds that almost anyone can publish. So it seems really strange. 232, he seems to be saying that anyone can put something on the Internet, which is true. Twitter, Facebook, anywhere, complaints, documents, films, doesn't matter, to YouTube influence, not important. So what, what, what's, what's now involved, what's now involved is this value that we have to the film, and we prefer the film to the painting. And that's very, very important. Uh, and that's kind of the claim that's made. All of this stuff in the background, which we don't pay any attention to, is nonetheless more important to us. Or this is a Lincoln a photograph I took at, at in, in in front of the Fordham's Lincoln Center. Why? Because they were filming a, a commercial, and the odd thing about that is you get the aura of the commercial on a street that, if you've not been down uh, at uh, uh, Lincoln Center itself, you would have seen a number of times, again and again, repeatedly. So one of the foremost tasks, but it doesn't look the same because the strange, you know, props, even though you don't see any of the, I didn't photograph the cameras or the, or the set crew or anybody who's there. So what art has always been about for Benjamin is the creation of a demand which could be fully satisfied only posthumously. So in a sense, everything that Arendt is talking about with regard to the oddity of her friend, Walter Benjamin, from the time when she too was fleeing from Paris, fleeing to go to New York as he was going to New York. She shared that. What different trajectories their lives followed? His did not, hers did. All of this posthumous destiny is built into the work of art. So to create a demand which could be fully satisfied only later and deliberately because it begins with Duchamp. Okay, begins with Duchamp, Dadaism, the artists breaking their own rules, the artists shaking up art. Warhol is nothing compared to Duchamp or Dadaism in general. So here we have a Duchamp. Uh, they, what they intended and achieved, and all he did was go put on a little mustache on Michelangelo, not Michelangelo, Leonardo's Mona Lisa. Uh, a destruction of the aura of their creation, which they branded as productions, as creations, because now this is a new work. This is, this is Duchamp. Or the most famous Duchamp, which he didn't even make, and he didn't even put anything on, although he did sign it. He, he signed it, Ah Mut, which of course in German means poverty, 1917, when almost anything could be submitted. It was not a problem. There'd be no prizes. It didn't matter. And so he chose to submit this urinal, which is, of course, sitting upright, not connected to the wall. You see, this is where it would be connected to the wall, sitting on, on its side, and presented that to be exhibited in the society of <clears throat> independent artists in New York. They said no way and rejected it. And so he promptly took it to Alfred Stieglitz's studio, 291 it was called, Fifth Avenue, and it was photographed. That is closed, the studio is no longer there, but although the number is still there, uh, <clears throat> all we have since it was promptly thrown out because someone thought it was a urinal and chucked it, uh, is the photograph. So there is no example. Since Duchamp lived to, to 1968, he made many, many, many copies of his own work, but none of them were the original because the original is, is basically this, the photograph, because the original is lost. There's no original. I claim, once again, if you like movies, you're basically uneducated, according to Duchamp, but why? 
put yourself on a darkened screen, <clears throat> in, in front of a darkened screen, in, in, pardon me, in a darkened room in front of a screen, what we're doing to a certain extent now, and you're putting yourself and your mind into a completely distracted state. Once again, Rudolf Arnheim, whom Benjamin quotes is the point here, the psychology of art, the psychology of reception. So that means that you are distracted and in film, receiving in a state of dis distraction is pretty much what you're doing. That's why popcorn is, is, is sold, right? It's kind of a crucial thing. That's why people will go on dates to movie houses and so on. But that is really what's happening with a film as such. And as I say, Arnheim is a part of that. And then we are at the epilogue, the conclusion. You have this increasing, this is what his Marxist friends were faulting him for, not, not being exact, exact. But for him, it was a real issue. Proletarianization of modern man and the increasing formation of masses. You have this growth of the mass man. Think also of Le Bon, the same thing, and Simul, who could also be looking at two aspects of the same process. Everyone has the taste of everything they look at on the internet because they program themselves with that taste over and over again. And that means that and this is what fascism does. And this is what capitalism has done ever since. One organizes the proletarian masses, but people's possessions, the wealthy who have wealth are not impacted. So even in national socialism in Germany does not, although they have socialism in the name of the title, impact the actual wealth of the wealthy even if they try to bring in and sort of equalize things somewhat for the masses or even a universal health care plan, still does not destroy the property structure. And the only thing that makes anything a contrary movement to the proletarian masses is destroying the property structure. And I think that Adorno and Horkheimer would have agreed with that because almost any Marxist would. <clears throat> The claim that's made is that it's two, it's two contests, 241. The masses have the right to change the property relations. Who says that you should have you know, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or thousands of thousands or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, up to millions of dollars? Who says you should have that? So the masses have a right to change that. They, they did so. They did so in the French Revolution. Right. A very, very important thing to do. Fascism tries to do that, but fascism gives them a way to do that. That's that wonderful thing that happens, as we see that here in 1935 in Nuremberg. You get to change things without changing anything. And that's very similar to what we have, of course, as we under recognize it in the United States. Shouldn't destroy property. So the logical result, this is where people get very, very, very uh, anxious, but it's very important, is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. We live on that term today, obviously, very crucial. And the efforts to render politics aesthetic, if you want to do that, you're only going to get one thing, says Benjamin, war can't go any other way. And then he quotes weird and very interesting, the futuristic manifesto of Manetti. That's what he looked like, born in Alexandria, dies, wonderful place to die, Bellagio is beautiful, in Italy, but there you are. And this is one of his manifestos. He has also you have here, poesia, poesie, remember Hegel, the highest form of art. And he says, war is beautiful. Now this is less shocking because people wear masks all the time. But at the time, this would have been a very, very interesting thing. Why? Because it shows the dominion of the machinery by gas masks terrifying megaphones, flamethrowers, and small tanks. And of course, you can get a mask to Turismo and express your sentiments if you want it in that same way. And Boccioni, dynamism of cyclists, who of course gives us another aspect of that. And that's the transhumanism again, or is beautiful because it initiates the dreamt of metalization of the human body, you can see that, you can see that in MoMA if you go, it's actually not, not very large, but it's worth seeing. If you haven't seen it and you're in New York, go, because you, 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 it will stay with you for the rest of your life. And finally, war is beautiful because it creates a new architecture. What kind of architecture? The big tanks, the geometrical formation flights, we have that with chemtrails and whatnot, the smoke spirals from burning villages and many others. 
beautiful because it enriches the flowering meadow with the fiery orchids of machine guns. And this is what Benjamin quotes in 1930s. It's a very interesting thing. We have to think about that. And therefore, you have this idea that there is a press, age of technological reproduction, unnatural utilization, found in war. So humanity, an object of contemplation for the gods, now an object for itself. And we are primarily interested in the transhuman ideal that would be AI. And therefore, this is Benjamin's prediction. I hope he's wrong. We can all hope he's wrong. He's been wrong on everything else, according to Gombeck. Self-alienation, that it can experience its own destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order. Now, Walter Benjamin, that as we have tried to work this out, is of course one of the primary uh, go-to references when it comes to political aesthetics or aesthetic politics or the aesthetics of politics, the various ways that one can think about this. And of course you recognize perhaps Jacques Mancier who also writes on the topic, but there's a good deal else besides. And unfortunately, the current circumstance that we find ourselves in rather suggests that that cannot but continue. Okay. And now, what is meant by this? How do we think about art and the public sphere, public art, political art? all of these very, very great topics, no way at the end of a lecture to address any of that. But what we can do is note the parallels to the conclusion, the epilogue uh, of Benjamin's essay, this is the situation of politics, which fascism is rendering aesthetic. There's an aesthetic everywhere. There's an aesthetic in the current pandemic and some have really sought to do that namely making little images. There are uh, glass reflections of this very enigmatic uh, figure, which of course, as we saw, is already built into the iconography of the past. And Joseph, who teaches at the School of Visual Arts and former colleague of mine down at uh, uh, on 23rd Street, uh, Joseph Nechvatal, he's in Paris and has been throughout the pandemic, uh, composed the complete viral symphony. Notice the uh, not at all accidental zero in place of an O. So you can go and hear at least portions of that, not all of it, but portions of it on YouTube. We are in an aesthetic realm. We are mediated through technology. We need to talk about this. This won't be enough. We'll come back to this in some later portions of the class. But this is the situation of politics, which fascism is rendering aesthetic. We have, we can imagine this as a transhumanist image. That's all it is. But we can certainly recall that here's obviously a film canister, that there's elements of the aesthetics of Fritz Lang, the, the 20s, the late 20s, the early 30s. This is the is aesthetics that you could say is almost a century old and yet still so contemporary that we use it to represent syringes and or the future, putting in little nano uh, particles to join with our DNA and not, of course, for any good purpose. Communism, the last line, very complicated, circa 1936 response by politicizing art. There you have, it's obviously. And yet this is an ideal, but it is one which dialectic or not dialectic is a little bit challenged or limited. A few other things, if we were developing this further, if we had more time, and certainly you may want to research that further. That would be Benjamin's own notebooks. These he carried around with him. Hannah Arendt talks about that. They're the same notebooks that actually correspond to Heidegger's uh, black notebooks. And he wrote his some of his ideas, but mostly also citations, things that he copied from others, right down in such notebooks. And this is this is one which, of course, also happens to have a, a register 
built into it, a, a, a T, U, uh, V, W, X, Y, Z, and so on. So, so obviously you could, you'd already have an alphabetized roster. Of the essay that we've been talking about, and we've said this briefly, but just to recap, three versions exist. The first of which is published in 1935 and written 35 in, but it, in fact, it's published in French. One assumes that there was an earlier version of that, but when it came out, because it's not clear, uh, is in the German. Uh, Frankfurt School Organ, the Zeitsche für Sozialforschung, but it's published in French, L'Oeuvre d'Art, à l'époque de sa reproduction mécanisée, and you can see right away why that would be the case, there's the Zeitsche für Sozialforschung, and you see that it itself appears at the Librairie Félix Alcan in Paris, so that means that that portion of the Frankfurt School is not in Frankfurt at the time, but already emigre, already in exile, and the exile is a Parisian one. And then you mean uh, like, a, like Anders, Gunther Anders, uh, uh, Hannah Arendt's uh, husband, uh, as Gunther Stern, is also there. So that's one of the issues. And we can look at the appearance because what we are thinking about then in that context will be just the three versions. Uh, so th there is a version two then will be the German version because the French version counts as the first version, but the French version is a translation of the German, of course. And then the third version, which you can see the second version in this, uh, the collected works of, of, of Walter Benjamin selected, they're selected. You, you will note if you see uh, the John Hughes documentary on documentary, but it's also a very creative uh, f film piece interviewing various individuals, but among them, uh, the head of Harvard University Press talking about the real challenge that it is to get collected works, every, all the collected works into English. We don't have them in the case of Heidegger. We don't have them in the case of Nietzsche. Uh, it's a problem in, in English. So you would have also the third version, and that version is also the one that you can find in the larger collection on the work of art in the age of its technological reproducibility. This is nothing compared to the debates. There's a huge literature and we only picked one or two, three things, three actually, but two of them mostly on Benjamin. George Marcus, and Marcus is a student uh, uh, ad collide follower of he, the late George Marcus of another Georgie, Georgie Lukács, uh, and he writes on the German reproduction debate in order to really engage his friends. Uh, uh, and it's very important to remember that there, is a, there are a lot of in groups uh, in this area. In particular, Hans Ulrich uh, Gumprecht and Michael Marinan, who in 2003, so quite some time ago, uh, write, uh, edit, collect the work of art in the digital age. And they begin, and this is what Marcus cites, is the most frequently cited, most intensely debated. But the problem is, and that's of course what the book looks like, that the past seven decades show that there's no reason for that. So you see a certain amount of maybe resentment, who knows, uh, that almost none of Benjamin's central predictions have proven to be right. There are has not disappeared. Now that's hard to say what that means because we, we don't really know what that means. Uh, and it doesn't seem to me that that's very accurate in any case, but it doesn't matter. It's common to, to, to hear that. But conquered even the field of arts technical reproduction. So it's there. Um, unclear, but nonetheless, that's the assertion. Film hasn't developed along the lines indicated by him into a critical medium for the masses. Is that so? We don't know. They say so, but it doesn't matter. There's literature on either side of the claim. So there's literature that would support Gumbrecht's comment. Uh, and of course, also uh, uh, Mahri Nan in this case. And so, well, ah, and speaks of pharma. Here's a kind of a statue depiction of the Roman goddess. And of course, it's a goddess, luck be a lady, right? You may remember Fortuna is, is a woman and a woman because of the fickleness. And 
a certain amount of misogyny involved in that. But, but she speaks of posthumous fame, but Marcus talks about the paradox. Why does he continue to live? Why does he become so famous? And you could almost think that he's thinking, why is Lukash not much rather famous in, in, in his place? But of course, it is Benjamin. Scholarly disputes continue. You know, what matters, which is pretty much how one decides that this is important, that's not important. And then someone comes along and says, no, this is important, that's not important. And they continue apace. But Benjamin remains. We go back to that question just one last time, just to help remember the aura. We define the aura, if we recollect, as the unique phenomenon of a distance, however close it may be. And we talked about the Enfernung, the bringing close, uh, also the focus in terms of Arnhem and his aesthetic psychology. And we read again, if while resting on a summer afternoon, you follow with your eyes a mountain range on the horizon or a branch which casts its shadow over you, you experience the aura of that branch those mountains okay reasonable enough but we repeat that maybe with some ellipses to allow this to be clearer to us the aura as a unique phenomenon of a distance however close it may be if while resting on a summer afternoon you follow with your eyes a mountain range on the horizon you experience the aura of those mountains you bring them close as they are to you and if you prefer a different mountain range, a little brighter, uh, the other was actually a photograph in color, but it's hard to see that because it's, it was very dark, very shadowy and turning into twilight. But here, mid-afternoon, a little clearer, and you can imagine following with your eyes the edge of the cliffs in the distance. And one can recall, just as Heidegger talks about Gestell, uh, the technological apparatus was set up, as Heidegger also talks about Gebmut, meaning the disposition or mood one might have. He also speaks of Gebirge, and Gebirge are ber bergen, mountains that are in a range, changed together, all of them there. You can, when you follow them, bring them and the achievement that it would be to climb them, to crest the peak close. That's already in your own impression of them as you gaze in all relaxed uh, confidence, the awe that you take in, experience, can encounter. G. Emmerling looks at it just a little bit differently. He is the author uh, in 2005 of Theory for Art History, and he's one of our other authors, and Photography, History, and Theory. And he gives us an art history of means that appears in the Journal of Art Historiography in 2009. And Looking at this question of the means or looking at this question of medium, he's drawing upon conversations that he tells us he had at UCLA with Giorgio Agamben, who's the author of The Man Without Content. And he invokes several other texts. We just want to look at their book covers here because they're very interesting and they give you a sense of this Beatrice Hansen, Walter Benjamin, sorry about that, other history of stones, animals, human beings and angels, and Walter Benjamin, and the demands of history, Michael Steinberg. So that for properly art historical reflections is worth your while. Uh, Emmerling himself is also interested in uh, architecture as well as poetry on which he writes. And then finally, and we won't be able to do more than just kind of briefly mention this, Frisbee who gives us several epigraphs, and we remember from Hannah Arendt how important those are. Max Raphael, 1910, we will only learn to know and love what's new in the world city through what's visible and comprehensible through the transformations of phenomena in the street. And Zimmel himself, the adventurer, deals with the incalculable element of life, just as we otherwise relate to the securely calculable, and for this reason, the philosopher is the adventurer of the mind. And that's a wonderfully Kantian way of looking at the philosopher who, who remember Kant's great fondness for uh, uh, seafaring uh, uh, metaphors might undertake uh, a great uh, and arduous trip 
on a ship through this or that strait, coursing around the border of this or that island of truth, which it can't in fact refers to. And then Jens, yeah, reviewing Zimmer's philosophy of money, that's the third of the epigraphs, at the moment in which a person becomes astonished at the every day that they become a philosopher. In researching and musing over the nature of this every day, they attain the knowledge that they know nothing. That's 1908 and still true. It is the philosophy of money, Georg Simmel, that probably should be coming into its own now. Already I pointed to several weeks ago, the fact that Zimmel's star is rising. This is, this is a still, a bit of a still slashed out from Fritz Lang's Metropolis. And these are, of course, the workers in their productive aspect turned into utterly nothing at all, spirit broken. You can almost imagine them. They certainly look as if they might, all of them, already be wearing masks. Here they are wearing masks because, of course, you've got the problem with your distance and the money is still an issue because part of what's involved is the need to not have contact, no shaking of hands, no hugs, no human connection and no uh, legal tender. So increasingly you see our little COVID friend, that's one of the problems. Frisbee's page 14 cites Simmel's Soziologische Ästhetik, and he writes that the aesthetic dimension of the adventure with its escape into another world in which security is replaced by insecurity, and remember the image of the mountain, you might actually be camping out, deliberately choosing to forego things like running water and sheets and a bed and so on, security replaced by insecurity by an absolute presentness accords with a particular mode of interpreting the world that's far away from the routinized calculations and ostensibly organized rational economic universe. The aesthetic mode, this is the interesting point, is predicated upon the fact, and the quote is from Zimmel, that the essence of aesthetic observation lies in the fact that the typical is to be found in what's unique, the law-like, in what's fortuitous, the essence of things in the superficial and transitory. So pretty much it's not, it's, it's the exception proves the rule. It's that you really do need to have that exceptional moment to the adequately trained eye. The total beauty, the total meaning of the world as a whole radiates from every single point. And that's the metropolis. And it's hard to think, and since that's, that's the aesthetic focus that Georg Zimmel offers us, it's hard to think that we have eclipsed that. Certainly Blade Runner as a film is still in the genealogy of this film, Metropolis has just moved up a little higher, there's a lot more rain, and you don't really see the bridges of the cars crossing between them. Next week, and we I hope we'll in, in enjoy this because it's uh, certainly more optimistic and positive. Uh, hans Georg Gardinger, here's the Reklam edition that I have. Well, I have it in New York anyway. Die Aktualität, die Schönen. Uh, the relevance of, of, of the beautiful. I do have, I do have a copy of that, of the English here. And there's a nice introduction by Robert Bernasconi, which is worth uh, attention. And then to kind of prove the relevance of the, the, the beautiful, the actualität, Reklam has, I don't have a copy of this, but they have a kind of modernized their cover of all things for Gadamer's essay, which is probably worth an essay, but not today. And then one last thing just to close with Adorno, which you can also look at. And that was the last of the uh, essays, which we didn't get to and hope we will be able to pick up. But that's Wilson's Dialectical Aesthetics and the Kantian Rettung, which is actually about Adorno. And we did have, but didn't quite touch on this reference to the culture industry and a monopoly. All mass culture is identical and the lines of its artificial framework begin to show through. It's not clear that we're not more familiar with that than we would like to be. But of course, it's very unclear if the lines of the framework are showing through at all. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you Monday.